Hello and good afternoon. My name is Joe Malouf. I'm an advocate for freedom of speech and human rights and the founder of Human Dignity Union, a newly established NGO in uh, Lebanon. I will be hosting this uh, session together with Preeti Nalu. Hello, Preeti. Preeti is from IMS, International Media, uh, uh, International Media Support, a Copenhagen-based media development organization working to support independent media in countries of conflict and transition. Preeti, you've been in Lebanon and you've seen a lot other than COVID-19. The revolution, one of the biggest explosions, non-nuclear explosion in Lebanon, among other unprecedented events. How difficult was it for you to witness all this? Well, thank you, Joe. As you pointed out, it's been a year of crises within crises for Lebanon. While the rest of the world is reeling under the pandemic measures, um, Lebanon, along with several lockdowns amid a severe economic crisis, also experienced the Beirut port blast on um, August 4th, where tons of explosives detonated, uh, bringing down entire neighborhoods. So the need for media recovery is uh, a tremendous challenge. And at International Media Support, we have been working with uh, intensively with various media partners um, in the Middle East amid COVID, and particularly with Lebanon. And we'll get to those details later in the show. Indeed, one of the most debilitating pandemics in modern history took over the world this year. From the smallest island to the largest country, it has indeed become a universal challenge. With borders closed, airports empty, trains uh, halted, most countries are struggling to find local solutions for global problems. The challenges are many while good journalism is an essential tool in our recovery. It is also the most gravely affected areas, which is the topic of this session. Let's watch a short introduction from IMS director Jesper Hoiberg. Now more than ever, we need news we can trust. We are seeing media businesses collapsing. We are seeing attacks on media freedom and we are seeing journalists being threatened both off and online. We see an avalanche of mis- and disinformation, of fake news spreading fast. But in the midst of this we see a, a ray of hope. We've seen how COVID-19 has reawakened people, ordinary citizens, understanding of the importance of critical, reliable information. In IMS, we aim to support media across the world. And since the beginning of March, we have seen how media partners are finding new and very creative solutions to informing the public. In today's session, we'll hear from eight parts of the world where IMS partners will report live on how global challenges have found very specific local solutions. Now with an introduction from Copenhagen, we are ready to connect to the successful journalists and leaders who have found ways of telling the important stories through solutions and accountability journalism in a period where newsroom budgets are shrinking. Preeti, you have been working with these media organizations. Can you tell me more about what AMS does with them? Absolutely, Joe. Um, one of IMS's core approaches is um, long-term partnerships. It is in our DNA to listen to the practitioners, the journalists and the media outlets that are living these challenges so that we may form the full picture mm. and help them in the most meaningful ways. And this is exactly what we've done at IMS um, in helping build local solutions-based journalism through media across four continents. Um, and in addition to building their capacity Capacity, we also support uh, rights groups um, working on freedom of expression and social and uh, legal changes of um, media. And uh, in this uh, crisis period, we have looked at the challenges, but we've also sought uh, solutions and opportunities, and we're thrilled to be presenting some of the insights of our local partners that have worked with IMS. Let's uh, have a look at the world map that takes us around the different locations we're visiting today. We're going to be starting in the Philippines, uh, 
and then we'll go to Lebanon, followed by Zimbabwe, Belarus, Myanmar, Pakistan, Somalia, and then Syria. And so thank you, Joe, for taking us around the globe in this short frame of time. Thank you, Preeti. We're going to start our journey. We're going to go first to the Philippines. I'd like to welcome my guest, Carl Javier. He's the COO at Puma Podcast, the first podcast network in the Philippines. Welcome, Carl. Um, hello. Thank you. Um, let me start with COVID as an event. How did you find ways of creating engaging content during a phase where all stories roamed about COVID-19? And how did COVID-19 shape your podcast? So we, we had a regular news podcast, but it was very challenging because under lockdown, we had absolutely no access to our studio. We, it was unsafe for us to go in and, uh, and try and report stories on our own in the field. So we had to innovate and we had to try and find ways to continue to keep people informed. And we didn't want to compete with breaking news where that news kept changing every few hours. So we decided to try and capture people's stories. And so we began sourcing narratives from people on the ground. We, uh, we threw out the idea of being able to control audio from the studio and we just took whatever audio we could find from people reporting, people traveling, people in the hospitals, and then brought those together and started creating podcasts out of those uh, specific stories. Uh, and then as the pandemic progressed, um, people were locked down and we needed to try to find ways so that we could continue to find hope and to look forward. And so we actually launched new podcast properties uh, that were providing people with a space so that they could uh, offer ideas for when we were finally outside of lockdown and we could change our situation. But, but, but how did you overcome the challenges of reduced newsroom budgets? Tell me more about the new innovations that helped you do this. So everything went digital. Uh, so what we just had to do was change the way that we were using our manpower mm -hmm. um, and essentially reallocate our resources from, say, uh, being out into the field or, again, being out in the studio and then using the uh, new, I guess, the new bandwidth that we had from being stuck in, at home and using that now to uh, cure the audio that we had or to try to stitch together uh, more complex stories uh, and build out the story because, uh, I mean, we weren't looking at it as, oh no, we're going to run out of money. It's given this limited amount, what kind of stories can we produce? And given the limited opportunity to do reporting, uh, how can we uh, continue to bring insight to, to our listeners? Thank you, Carl. Uh, we're going to move forward to my home country, uh, Lebanon. My next guest is Alia Brahim. Alia is the CEO of Daraj uh, Media. Daraj is an independent digital media platform created by experienced uh, journalists. Alia, for instance, has worked on Washington Post, Al Arabiya, before she came to Daraj Media. Daraj's goal uh, is to offer Arabic speakers an alternative kind of journalism free from political funding and influence. Hello, Alia. Um, Lebanon is experiencing an unusual high level of pressure with the economic crisis that was amplified by the pandemic and then one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in human history. How has this shaped your role in holding the powers at play accountable? Well, indeed, Joe, for the last year, since October last year, Lebanon has been ongoing one of the biggest crises in its modern history. Uh, um, let's, let, to, to put it very fast, half of the population, more than half of the population is under poverty line. The local currency has lost more than 80% of its value. So the situation was already tremendously difficult when, when we started dealing with the COVID-19. And then uh, comes the uh, August 4 explosion, one of the biggest in, in recent history, uh, um, I think that put us in front of the challenge where as, as much as we stick to our role as uh, our, what, what is in our DNA, an impact-driven uh, journalism uh, uh, media company, 
uh, what we did is we found ourselves in a position where we had to work mm. with other partners in society uh, on top of our journalism, obviously, but to fill in the gaps that the government is not filling. We th- we're looking at the situation where you have to deal with reconstruction, you have to deal with education. Obviously, you're dealing in a, uh, with a situation where you already have very high levels of poverty. Inside, add to that a refugee crisis that is becoming increasingly more problematic every day. So just sticking to our uh, um, role as as uh, an, an, a journalistic uh, media was not enough at some point. We started dealing with other civil society uh, uh, partners, whereas we help them at least turn what policy papers, for example, projects that they work they are working on basically what the government should be doing in a in a in a normal situation yeah. we found ourselves partnering with 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 these people to uh, help pretty much uh, get over this crisis yeah. um, alia Adding forces among independent media seems to be even more important now than before. Daraj Media is part of a media corporation with the focus on COVID-19 covering more countries. Can you tell us more about this? Well, um, the, the idea of collaborating on the COVID-19 uh, problems right, right from the beginning was, was really, uh, it appeared to be like a very natural process to be happening. A lot of the problems that are happening in one place are happening in another place. And let me very quickly tell you about this. For example, COVID in most of the areas of the region was used as a political tool by the governments, for example, to oppress protests to tell people you're not allowed to go on the streets anymore. Mm. This put an end, this was happening in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Sudan, in Algeria. Uh, so that it was used as a political tool. On the other hand, we, we were facing a similar problem in the sense once more that the governments were telling people we have a lockdown yeah. now, go home without uh, giving any mm. alternative, without giving providing any new sources of income. So uh, um, what uh, fake news is, is again, yeah. not being capable of trusting the information you're getting from the government was a problem coming from yeah. uh, from the different uh, from the different parts that, of the world that was at the heart of a collaboration between the different uh, uh, independent yeah. media who started let, working together sharing information yeah sure. let me bring uh, Preeti here as we know the 4th of August blast changed among many things the journalism uh, scene could you share some of IMS insights and involvement in the recovery efforts And I hope I get to reiterate some of uh, Alia's sentiments as I answer that. Um, IMS is part of the Beirut uh, Media Recovery Fund, Mm -hmm. which is one of the largest globally, um, such globally funded or supported efforts. And uh, the Beirut-based Samir Kassir Foundation has been working on this multi-track program, which includes economic livelihood, um, physical recovery, psychosocial support, and of course, uh, accountability uh, journalism that are built into the entire recovery effort and uh, we're coordinating among different organizations to ensure that the right parts of journalism are rebuilt and uh, also based on the expressed desires of our partners such as Daraj um, and other Lebanese uh, journalists and newsrooms. Yeah, Thank you Alia to you and to everyone at uh, uh, Daraj. I'd like to ask our audience to express Uh, you can express, you can uh, share your ideas uh, on the platform while discussing with our guest speakers. I'm going to move now to IMS partner um, uh, ZimFact, one of Africa's leading fact-checking initiatives, debunking fake news and providing essential information during COVID-19. I'd like to welcome Lifa Khan Nari. Welcome, Lifa. Thank you. Um, During COVID-19, a massive flood of disinformation has been spread. How do you go about debunking false information and how big a part of your work is focused on COVID-19 these days? Uh, Thank you. Uh, I think I can say it's been a crazy and challenging year for fact checkers across the globe looking at the issue to do with COVID-19 and misinformation around that. I think it has been referred to as a disinfodemic because there's been lots of information going out there and in the midst of all that information, there's been a lot of misinformation and disinformation. 
And because it's been such a huge issue, it also forms a large part of the work that we do here at ZenFact of fact checking. So what we've been doing is we, uh, we're looking at the most viral claims that go around and then we'll fact check those because a lot of misinformation goes around in Zimbabwe, around uh, social media platforms. If you're talking about Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, most of the citizens are on those platforms, especially the urban citizen, and a lot of misinformation has been going around on those platforms. So what we do is we take the viral claims and we talk to health experts, we talk to public officials, we talk to health officials, we talk to scientists, and we go around debunking some of the myths and some of the claims that would have been made on those platforms and on, on those uh, stories going around. We are also fortunate that we've got the support of the network of the African Fact Checkers. We are part of that network. Mm. So every month, every two weeks, we meet and we look at the stories that we've done. We share ideas and we share most of the stories that we have done that pertain to Zimbabwe around COVID-19 and misinformation. But, but Lifa, why does misinformation and disinformation spread so fast among people and who benefits from that? Uh, I think it's, it's because um, information has almost become a, a weapon to be used. And we've seen in the issues to do with COVID-19 that some governments may rise and some might fall on the strength of how they handle COVID-19. So in Zimbabwe, we find that it's mostly the political elites that... Um, gain a lot of mileage from misinformation because the information that they give out to citizens, they use it as a weapon, it's a contested space, and they get to know, to get support from citizens by using this misinformation. For instance, one of the fact checks that we did recently was when our president said that um, Zimbabwe had been ranked as one of the best performing countries in the world in their handling of COVID-19. And this wasn't true. WHO had done no such ranking. And we also find that the opposition will also have stories where they are saying um, Zimbabwe is the worst in terms of testing. We also did that fact check and it wasn't true. So I think it's this uh, politicization of information that makes misinformation and disinformation yeah. spread so fast in the country. And because people are using social media platforms, anyone can generate any content. Exactly. So that's why you've got lots yeah. of uh, misinformation and disinformation going around. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lifa. Now we're going to move to Pakistan and editor of Lok Sujag Badar Alam. In many countries, COVID-19 has been used as a tool to further repress the right to freedom of expression. In Pakistan, digital harassment led by the ruling party's online vigilantes has scared many independent information practitioners into silence. In August 2020, a group of over 20 best known and independent women uh, journalists, they wrote a joint open letter to the PM against their want on harassment, trolling and vilification by his party's online vigilantes. After getting no help or assurances, um, they have now petitioned the Islamabad uh, High Court for safety to continue operating as independent voices in journalism. IMS partner Lok Sujag has reported on the matter. Uh, I'd like to welcome editor Mr. Badr Aram. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome Badr. Sure. To what extent has the media been able to report during COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, it has been a very uh, tough kind of a test for the media to report on this pandemic because the information was not really forthcoming. The government was uh, collecting all the information and actually depositing it at a central point and releasing it uh, at, at its own whims and fancies. Sometimes figures were fudged, sometimes outrightly fake figures were uh, uh, bandied about, like like my Zimbabwean colleague has just said, the government at one stage said that the way Pakistan was handling the uh, pandemic was, uh, and was such an example that even the United States was following that, which was obviously not true. So it was difficult for the media to sift a lot of uh, fiction from the facts of the pandemic and then report on it. And unfortunate, uh, trend in all of this is that uh, most of the commercial media, mainstream media organizations were either buying the government uh, propaganda or government data without questioning it, or they were just uh, voicing or mouthing uh, the opposition's unrestrained uh, kind of a criticism of uh, the government's pandemic's handling. So between the two uh, 
polls, the, the real information was being lost and the media was not really able to do much about it. But having said that, there were individual journalists like the one we have profiled in uh, our Lok Suryag reports. Uh, she's been doing a phenomenal job. Yeah. And there were many others who have uh, done enormous amount of work to, to you know, cancel yeah. and cancel out disinformation yeah. and misinformation and bring out correct information. But how would you describe the situation of journalists and specifically female uh, journalists exposed to online harassment? Uh, journalism in Pakistan, like in most other countries in the world, has become a very, very dangerous profession. Uh, especially on the social media, you face all kinds of harassment, all kinds of trolling, all kinds of threats. And our female colleagues are especially vulnerable to that. Uh, whenever they break some news, whenever they report on something, their personal lives, their family lives, their uh, ideology, their, even their looks become a subject of uh, trolling and harassment and threats. Uh, like you pointed out in the intro of this uh, segment, uh, many of them have felt so threatened that they uh, felt the need to go to the highest authorities in the country and yeah. ask for some kind of an action against this kind of, a, uh, of an harassment. And that action, unfortunately, has not come about. Uh, Yes, uh, at certain individual and institutional levels, journalists have done, uh, taken some steps to, you know, uh, board off or try to avoid these kind of threats. But in most cases, they still persist and uh, female journalists in Pakistan are more, more vulnerable to these threats and harassments than men are, but even men are not uh, living in a heaven right now. Yeah. Um, thank you, Badr. Uh, Preeti, speaking about the experiences of female journalists, our next guest speaker now is uh, a female rights defender. Uh, we're going to hear from a Syrian female journalist uh, network, not a traditional media, but a rights defender. Could you explain this dual track of IMS, both working with news outlets and civil society organizations? Well, exactly, Joe, because this feeds very much into the IMS approach of supporting independent media voices but also the rights organizations that are working on freedom of expression and, um, and, and reform. And uh, the Syrian Female Journalist Network is one of those organizations um, that has been relentlessly advocating for greater gender representation in the media, um, both as the editors and journalists in the newsrooms, but also as uh, experts and analysts on the other side of the camera. Yeah. And in this particular um, uh, period, they have been mapping out uh, vulnerabilities uh, related to uh, gender due to the pandemic. And in explaining more of these details, we are, uh, we're joined by Rula Assad. Really lovely to see your face on the screen today. Uh, very warm, warm welcome to you. Um, Rula, could you go into some of these details? What are the challenges that uh, Syrian female journalists and right defenders are facing, particularly uh, because of their gender? Right, actually from a feminist perspective, but of course we're adding the media lens to what we are doing. We are focusing on our work to see what the, and to reveal what unseen challenge that uh, women human rights defender they are facing, but also women journalists. And actually during the pandemic, the main challenge was the extra labor that they, they have to do, not only professionally, but also when it comes to domestic and emotional labor. Um, historically, actually, as in the media sector, uh, women journalists, they don't get a contract. I mean, uh, only like uh, whether freelance or they are volunteering. And during the pandemic, they, they were a concern. They are the, the first one to be sacrificed because many organizations they are faced start to be concerned about financial, economical, um, I mean, uh, uh, issues uh, during the <laughs> pandemic and the first lockdown. Of course, adding to everyone have been shared like restriction of the movement and then fear of getting the virus. And then, of course, if we are talking about uh, Syria as a country, we are talking about a very vulnerable, fragile uh, political situation, depending on where we are talking. And then we are talking about the health care that might provide with and but 
I mean, in the whole country, it's really a very, um, uh, I mean, a critical related to the infrastructure of many, many sectors. So this is basically what they are share. Of course, uh, that may mean that they have to be locked down. And I mean, as male journalists, but of course, women, again, I, I have to highlight again the extra labor they have to do and to taking care of everyone as a woman, but also as a journalist when it comes to their work um, within the sector during the pandemic and the first lockdown. Uh, precisely. Rula, you mentioned a very fragile and ever-changing landscape, and you've made quite a few gains over these years. Would you say that the pandemic period has uh, created setbacks, and what would help with recovery in this period? Well, it's a quite a big uh, uh, question and a challenging because we are still trying to have a conversation, open conversation, and looking what uh, our partner um, actually uh, trying to see alternative. We are trying to adapt to the very harsh, uh, I mean, um, situation by providing our partner with the internet uh, service because it's one of the main thing that they have to to do their work behind the computers from homes and then to keep contact to the, the outside world and then to produce content. And then during the pandemic, we try to highlight more about life, uh, live experience of women journalists, but also to be focused on the different materialities of the experience. Um, and this is what the women journalists start to provide, uh, I mean, more insight from how, for example, the discourse in the social media have been targeted women in it generally, but also women uh, journalists and women human rights activists who dare to talk about, for example, domestic violence, sexual violence during the pandemic and lockdown. And they are the ones who brought this uh, uh, issue to the public. Um, so basically, we are still trying to be very realistic with the alternative we are providing by keeping the, everyone motivated, but also taking care of everyone. I mean, our team, but also the partners So trying to do well I mean, collective well-being, but also individual by giving more space for all the challenges, stress, and um, trying to be more sensitive of what the, this pandemic is brought to the sector and unseen one. I mean, of course, everyone looked at the, at home, but then what's happening there? And if we want to, to, to put the gender lens and the, I mean, from more intersectional lens, like also talk about the class, ethnicity, sure. where they face the gender. Of course, it will add, I mean, more information to what we are receiving, just like we're talking simply about women journalists, with, I mean, during the pandemic. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Rula. And similar to the Syrian Female Journalist Network and other uh, also media outlets that have been uh, working over a long period of a transition, our partner across the globe, Frontier Myanmar, a media outlet, has been covering trans, uh, transitional politics in different parts of their country. Today, Sony Sway, their CEO, joins us. Thank you so much um, for being with us, Sony. And let's jump straight into the crux of the matter. Has COVID been used? How has COVID been used as a tool of oppression in Myanmar in this period? Well, um, we, we just... Uh, the second wave just started like uh, a little bit uh, before, one month before the elections. So that was a kind of uh, 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 crazy for everyone to, to, to cover both uh, COVID and the elections. Um, unlike the, uh, the first uh, wave, uh, second wave was quite uh, severe and uh, the government has to to um, issue the uh, very tight uh, regulations uh, because election was just around the corner um, and media uh, business uh, was wasn't uh, listed as as um, how do you say uh, essential business to run. So um, including all the medias, including Frontier. But apart from the, the state-run newspapers, we uh, were basically asked to stay home. And um, so that basically uh, changed the whole game. And, and uh, we had to figure out how we are going to cover elections and the, the, the COVID. So um, this is a very uh, a, a unique uh, situation for us. And, uh, you know, if we go out and get the job, uh, do what we have to do, then um, if we get caught uh, going out, then we might probably get uh, charged by the uh, 
um, the, the, the prison in imprisonment, uh, not long ones, but uh, still uh, we, we can get into the trouble. So um, I think uh, that applies, this regulations apply not only to the media, uh, to, to pretty much others' uh, businesses as well. Uh, but we had to find a, uh, a way to, to, to cover uh, both uh, COVID and the elections. Uh, yeah, that was quite interesting. Well, uh, thank you for that, Sony. And uh, he's referring to the uh, elections that happened yeah. in Myanmar in November, which uh, created issues with access due to COVID restrictions. And we'd love to hear more about that and hope that the viewers will um, have some questions and perhaps even some of the solutions that Frontier Myanmar would have found. But perhaps we move on to the next uh, section then. Yeah, we're going to uh, move to our uh, next guest uh, from City Dog. City Dog is a leading independent internet magazine in Minsk. Even under difficult circumstances, the media has proved to be viable during its seven years. Um, City Dog was working with IMS during the startup. Um, we're going to hear from Irina Vidanava, the CT CEO uh, at City Dog. Hello, Irina. Hello. Um, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. How did City Dog uh, role change during the pandemic, during COVID-19? Well, in Belarus, uh, the situation um, was a little bit different than in some other countries because uh, during the first wave, our government uh, discarded COVID as something not serious. Uh, they were hiding numbers of registered cases and victims including death rate, and it was independent media that took a role on uncovering the truth, on reporting and informing uh, the public about the real situation, while at the same time it was citizens, people, volunteers, who mobilized to provide assistance to frontline uh, medical workers and also to help the victims. Uh, at City Doc, uh, the civic engagement, fostering civic activism and building communities was at the core of our concept and editorial policy. So in the crisis time, the role that we played from the start just became even more significant and relevant for the society. So we don't just report on the situation, but we stay true to our mission. We listen to our audience and its needs. We are trying to provide them with solid advice. Uh, we publish a lot of guides and explainers, but most of all, we feature active citizens and inspire others to become active as well. But since, since I, I, I think eight months, you've been affected by not only COVID-19, you've been affected by the political instability. How did this affect all what you're doing? How did this affect uh, City Dog? Yes, the situation got worse uh, as we also, like Myanmar, had elections on August 9, which were reached and followed by mass protests, which continued until now for three months already. It coincided with the second wave of COVID, which is even harder than the first wave. Um, so on the one hand, our audience, as the audience of other independent media, increased significantly. On the other hand, we all know that business models do not work in the state of emergency. Um, we benefited actually from the uh, business model that City Doc has, which is prepaid uh, pre-packaged special partnerships, which were lined up before the COVID pandemic and before the, before the elections. But we anticipate that the things will get worse and tougher from now on. So the economic challenges will be really, really bad for us and for other independent media. But since the elections, uh, independent media experienced tremendous pressure and hardships from the government. The websites are being blocked, the journalists are being arrested, and City Doc is not the exception in this case. Our editor now is in jail um, serving administrative arrests, um, and we are expecting her to be out on the 14th of December. Our photographer is on trial today. Um, so we are short-handed and we are under a lot of pressure. So uh, Belarusian independent media are resilient, as you said, they are very creative, they're brave, uh, but we will need uh, international support uh, in the upcoming months as we we'll have, uh, as Belarus as a country will need it. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. 
Um, uh, before I introduce our last guest speaker, I'd like to ask all our audiences to share your thoughts, ask your questions through the platform. And I'm going to welcome our last speaker of today with us from Nairobi, but covering and working in Somalia, Mohamed Sharif. You work as an editor of a specialist Somali broadcaster, Radio Ergo, which was established to raise local uh, voices and to focus on humanitarian uh, issues. You have adapted some of your content to enhance coverage around COVID. Welcome, Hamad. Could you explain you. to me how and what were the means and tools that you deployed to spread awareness around COVID-19 crisis and the precautions that you've been uh, uh, giving, telling people about them? Thank you. We already have years of experience in how to reach different Somali audiences effectively with accessible and locally contextualized information on critical humanitarian issues. We are on air every day across the country with reporting from the ground and special daily and weekly segments on key issues and affecting communities' lives and livelihoods. When the lockdown measures were implemented in Somalia, we quickly developed new programming segments to communicate around COVID. One of the challenges we faced was that Somalis did not believe that COVID was real or could affect them. People were saying COVID didn't affect Muslims and all you needed to do was pray. So as an example of our response, we asked and selected Islamic leaders who are very powerful leaders in the community uh, to take part in radio programs, explaining medical and public advice on COVID in the context of Islamic teachings. Also, we encourage our listeners to call in to our feedback platform with their questions on COVID, which we had Somali speaking doctor. Yeah. And we had few doctors answer in a, a weekly program. It's very important, as you know, to listen to what people have to say and to engage them in dialogue. We also use radio drama, which is very popular format in Somalia. And we started a family drama series raising COVID uh, issues entitled The Safe Kiba. But since you were telling me that uh, some people do not believe that there's COVID-19 and you needed to use some Muslim figures to spread awareness, how do you see the long-term consequences of COVID on these communities in Somalia? Yeah, thank you. M most things are uh, back to normal at the moment in the sense that Somalis are under the impression that COVID has gone. So for us at Radio Ergo, we, th we feel it's our role uh, to broadcast information on how to keep safe. And because the virus is still there, there's the negative part that people are ignoring the reality. The positive part is that the media managed to come through the crisis we were really lucky that we had uh, donors through IMS to continue covering salaries, yeah. while many local radios uh, saw revenue disappearing uh, because the commercial advertisers stopped using them. Yeah. Uh, it remains to be seen what the long-term effects are as the risk of second wave of COVID remain, and we don't know what the impact will be. Thank you, Mohammed, for being uh, with us. This year, was definitely not like every other year for everyone, with no exception. But allow me to talk about some individuals whose lives were turned upside down during this year by fellow journalists and reporters, uh, uh, radio hosts and uh, TV hosts. These people who spent most of their lives on the field covering stories, talking to people, interacting with communities, working under pressure to deliver, working day and night to report. Some of them are jailed, some of them are arrested, beaten, tortured, kidnapped, or assassinated, and this year, most of us are facing budget cuts, job cuts, and sanitary risks. For those people, a big salute from everyone here at The Hague. Preeti, I think we do have some time to answer some of the uh, audience questions. There are quite a few questions coming in, and it certainly doesn't do justice to our speakers to reduce this uh, conversation. But since we started on Lebanon, and given the immense um, challenge that the country is experiencing, perhaps it's worth looking at um, one of the questions, which is um, 
we've talked a lot about creative local solutions. Since we are in an international setting today, what can the international community do and what can they do better? Alia, would you please answer that for us? And uh, sorry to have to keep it short though. Simplify a very complicated story. Uh, what the world can do, what the, the international community can do, is actually listen to the Lebanese population. Uh, at this time, it's very complicated because the government that we have right now has lost complete legitimacy. We're at a moment where we need international support, and we make we need to make sure that this international support does not come through the government that has lost its legitimacy. This is not an easy situation because most of the aid has to come through local partners that that. Uh, don't have the representation. Uh, uh, one of the biggest problems is that uh, most of these civil society actors have not even been elected because since we haven't had uh, elections for quite a while. Uh, what the international community has to do is uh, um, listen and uh, get back and support local actors that has the that have the credibility to respond very quickly to the needs of the population. We're talking here about uh, a population that is suffering from poverty. We're lagging behind in education. We're lagging behind in uh, uh, all kind of support. COVID obviously did not make the situation at all any better for anybody here. Uh, just keep listening. Our biggest fear is that Lebanon is going to get forgotten. The story is going to get is going to become uh, less important to the international audience. And this, if the, if this happens in a country at the crossroad right now, uh, um, becoming just a headline nobody wants wants to talk about, uh, uh, this could impact the livelihood of not just Lebanon. Uh, the region around it. So uh, just don't make Lebanon an item, uh, uh, an, an, an item down on the list of priority of the international community. Most importantly, don't go for the easy solutions because we have a history of that. Go for something that could have strategy to rebuild, to, to actually try to help the Lebanese get where they want to be. Since October last year, the Lebanese have been on the streets. Today they are not because they are exhausted, because they have said what they really want. Right. The, the country is completely ungovernable, but uh, uh, we need to get to the next step. Absolutely, Alia, and thank you for those reflections which apply to all of the countries of, that we've visited today. And uh, we'd love to keep up these discussions, and this is just the start of discussing local media responses to global challenges. And I'd like to thank you, Joe, thank and I'd you. like to thank, thank UNESCO for facilitating this illuminating discussion. And I wanted to end on a note by a, an author um, that talks about foot footpaths, how footpaths give the travellers reassurance. They do not abandon him in the middle of the unknown. They may traverse difficult country, but they're safe, securely anchored at both ends, the lifelines along which we move without fear. And I think that aptly sums up the spirit of this particular session, that that is what journalism does. It provides, it guides us through difficult terrain. Thank you very much and we hope to see you online.